Welcome, welcome everyone to an amazing session that we got someone who's been with us since day one, really helped us and supported the Black Blockchain Summit since 2018, has definitely been someone who's been a trailblazer in our space that we're thankful. That actually helped me out in some tough binds when I needed some real material in my first uh, speaking engagement in Zimbabwe. I definitely appreciate him allowing me to lift some of his uh, 2020, I think it was um, a Money 2020, uh, 2014 presentation. And I, I used it in, in Zimbabwe. So I just want to say thank you, Cameron Wilkins Thank you, thank you for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Oh, oh, humbly, humbly. Well, I just want to kind of catch up, you know, we, we've done this before and, and this year you've been able to, to come back and, you know, been going through the COVID, there's been a lot of things going on and uh, we've seen some cycles and we've seen many cycles. I mean, we've seen altcoins, ICOs, and we got a lot of things going on. We have things going on with ETH and, you know, I think it's NFT, so much going on, you know, catch us up. What, what's been going on? What's the latest and greatest with Gemini? We appreciate you, you know, building a, a product that's, that actually allows us to, as a community to know we have pillars that stand for, you know, again, good uses, regulatory compliance, and all the things that we need to, as an example of what our, our standards are in our community. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, thanks, thanks uh, for that. Um, and I think, so one of the, the products that we have recently launched that we're really excited about is the Gemini credit card. And so by swiping, you can actually earn crypto back up to two to 3% back. So you can earn Bitcoin every time you swipe the card. And it's, a, it's really a great way to stack sats. Um, I think one of the, the biggest questions people have is like, how do I time when I get into crypto? And this sort of takes the timing out of, out of the thought process because you're always sort of accumulating um, crypto as you go about your daily, daily uh, uses of, of credit cards and whatnot. And so we think it's sort of an easy access point into the space and takes away some of that, those, those questions around like, how do I time? How do I get in? We all know it's kind of impossible to time unless you're a professional and even then, you, you know, you need a crystal ball. So um, we think it's going to be a great way to onboard the next wave of people into the space. So we're really, really excited about that. So instead of earning flimsy airline miles or points or whatever, you can actually earn Bitcoin or any of the cryptos that we support. So we're really excited about that. And obviously we're in a bit of a winner right now, but that's actually kind of the best time to stack and, and start investing because exactly all that potential upside. I think people, they get dis, disheartened a little bit. And, and that naturally happens, of course, if you, you know, rode the last wave up or you bought towards the last peak. But uh, I, I think it's actually the best opportunity and people in the community who have seen this before. I mean, you've lived through how many how many cycles like you, you you've seen this this movie you know how it, it's going to play out so now is actually the most critical time of getting people in mm. and uh really just making sure it's easy for them yeah i think you make a, a sound a sound point about that next you know a billion i mean we got so many people who want to expose this how to get them into it and you know i remember uh you know local bitcoin you know you can literally go and just meet somebody and actually get access to it you know we've seen the atm but I, I think, again, with all those friction points, being able to use a credit card, something that people are already familiar with, and then being able to allow them to, to, to acquire stack sats. Like we, we really, I think, again, I'm not imposing my, my maximalist views and, I, and I'm open to everything. I'm just saying, just going through all this and seeing all the shenanigans, I'm just kind of like zeroed in. But what you're saying that stacking Satoshi, a Satoshi will always be a Satoshi. I don't care, it's always a Satoshi. Yeah. So giving them a credit card to get access to that and, and not going through, you know, the cold wallets and all those things that we're, we're looking at in the, in the past. What do you see then as we're looking at this opportunity as some of the things that, you know, beyond just, you know, getting people to be aware and understand the use cases, once they get their, their sats, what are some of the things that you, you, you see or envision Going, going forward in that regard. Yeah, so I mean, I, and I think you don't have to be a maxi per se to believe that Bitcoin's the right starting point for most people because 
the thesis is so sort of obvious and it's been hiding in plain sight for since inception, right? Like gold 2.0, it's hard money, fixed supply. It's truly fixed. It's the only commodity in the universe that, that's actually, or I'd say the observable universe that's actually fixed. It doesn't, the supply does not expand with demand. And people look at gold and they say, oh, it, it's, it's precious and it's scarce, but it's not actually fixed. And as that price goes up, the demand you know, expands the supply because it becomes more profitable to mine for gold in more uh, other places. Same for oil, as the price of oil goes up, you just develop innovation and better drilling technology to the point of where you get fracking in the US. Um, it, it was thought to be that, you know, there's peak oil production in the US and then fracking came along and then the US is a net exporter um, or could be, um, but, you know, we made some decisions to say, you know, we're, we're going to limit the drilling in our backyard and buy oil from other other people instead. But if we, you know, we could totally be a, a net exporter in oil, and that's just a function of demand increasing um, and, 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 and price, uh, bi the Bitcoin supply will not change. And that, I think once people wrap their head around that, the light bulb goes on and they say, oh, I get it. This is gold, but it's better because it's more divisible, more portable. It can go anywhere in the world and I can store it, you know, on a ledge, uh, you know, a treasure, a hardware wallet or, you know, with, with a, a feed phrase. Um, so I think that's like, it, it's the easiest to sort of understand and analogize in terms of getting into crypto. So I usually encourage people to start there. And whether that's getting, you know, signing up to an exchange like Gemini and buying as little as five dollars worth, which you can, I think most people also, they think you have to buy wow. an entire. <laughs> it's like, oh, but I, I can't afford, you know, twenty two thousand dollar Bitcoin. It's like that's okay. You can buy five dollars, ten dollars, and just start like educating yourself and learning. Um, and then I think the next logical step, of course, is Ethereum, right? This decentralized, massive global um, computer. And so I think those are the, you know, Bitcoin's the OG. It taught us, it gave us this blueprint of like, how do you decentralize the world? Um, it's money that works, it's purpose built for the internet, moves like email. Uh, at the end of the day, money is just information, right? Uh, An entry on a ledger. So why doesn't it work like all the other information that we interact with? And it should, and it can, and, and Bitcoin sort of proved that. So if you stream, you know, music, we stream movies, now we stream money in that sort of sense. Um, and I think what the, the, the funny thing about Bitcoin is like, it actually doesn't have to really do anything beyond just storing value and being fixed in supply. And so when we look at like places around the world where like they, they don't have like sound money and you actually don't have to look too far, you can look in your backyard, the US government, right? Um, it's historically been pretty well managed, like on a relative basis. Um, however, we're seeing near 10% inflation because of the printing and all the stuff that happened over the past decade that started in the financial crisis in 2008, which was the backdrop of when Bitcoin was created and has continued. And the, the real shame of it is if you don't have your value and assets that can reprice, then you are losing 10% a year and you may not be able to keep up with the cost of goods, which is not, not good. And I think, you know, we all like, we're seeing this money supply. I think it, it quadrupled in, in the past decade. It might be off a little bit on the mag yeah. somewhere in that you just look at the fed, the fed graphs and it's, it's kind of um, insane. Um, and I think, so we were right about inflation. We were right about that loose money is going to create these problems. Bitcoin hasn't reacted uh, in the way we thought necessarily at this point in time, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that it's an emergent store of value and it's going to move around and be more volatile because it just hasn't matured yet. We, we don't have, you know, hundreds of millions of people into it. It's new, it's growing, it's fledgling. And when the sort of uh, there's all these things going on around us, people pull back. And if they perceive Bitcoin as being new and sort of a risk on asset, they'll pull back. But I think the long-term thesis 
um, is, is still true because we've seen, you know, gold's been around for thousands of years and, and it's, it's got that head start. But Bitcoin, you know, our belief is it's, it's better than gold. It's gold, but does things better than, than gold itself. And so I think, I think it's just a matter of time. Like the long-term thesis is, is the same. It will continue to play out. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, I think first and foremost, it's, it's a store of value. There are programmable natures of Bitcoin and we'll sort of see where that goes. But obviously like Ethereum has more of that built in. It, the, the purpose of Ethereum is more around smart contracts and programmability. Um, so I'm not sure that Bitcoin actually has to do a whole lot more than getting more people in at this point. How about the layers? Are you into, I mean, I, again, we did a, a transaction from Nigeria to Zimbabwe, a remittance transaction. This is back in 2018, where we use a lightning node. We have like, you know, Raspberry Pi and Zim and one in Nigeria. And actually we paid out in a, through a bank in Zimbabwe. And I, you know, I think again, you know, Satoshi did, you know, as much that that could be expected. And now it's for us to, to, to build on top of that foundation. I think you spoke to it, like, again, that level one, super secure, consistent, and then we can kind of like get a little cuckoo bird. Or not. We can go in and experiment on top of that. Are those things that are part of what Jim and I, or what the work you've, you've been a part of, you know, points in that direction, or do you look at it in a different way? I think it's it's super critical to get as many people around the planet access to Bitcoin and, and a store of value, right? It's it's like the ultimate check and balance to bad behavior, uh, bad monetary policy. And so I think that gold is sort of, you know, it, it predates every all you know, all of this, right? Um, and, and I think having that ability, that 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 fixed supply, that hard money option. If things get bad or you're not liking what you're seeing, um, and and there's been rampant mismanagement or just mismanagement at ten percent a year, right? Um, but obviously, there's been governments where the mismanagement is significantly worse. I think that's it's critical for for like uh, empowering individuals to like protect their wealth um, to get as many people into Bitcoin as possible, like. I often say it's it's not just like a technology, it's a movement, it's a way of thinking. It's about being like a, a, a sovereign, independent individual, banking yourself. Um, those are super critical so that you're not tied to one system because unfortunately like systems get abused, right? And they, they there's an access problem and there's always like a central person in control and they can just say, hey, I don't want you in the system or whatever. And so I think it's super important to always have that exit strategy or that alternative like a Bitcoin. Um, but I think Bitcoin, so, so getting people in um, into crypto is, is a huge part of our mission. But we also have like an opportunity fund where we um, support core developers because um, it's super important to also make sure that Bitcoin continues to improve and stay secure all this is sort of for naught if like Bitcoin doesn't work and Ethereum isn't, you know, if these don't play out. So we, we, we think it's important to give back and support the core developers. Um, and there's not a ton of them. It's a small community and, and they're sort of all over the, the world and super passionate. Um, but it's hard to make a living working just on a, on a protocol unless there's support and, and grants and whatnot. So we definitely try and play our part in that. And I think that's been around for the past two years or so. And we've given at least, I think, uh, $2 million in grants okay. away to support the underlying protocol because we're, we're all nothing and we wouldn't be here without Bitcoin. So that that's sort of um, job zero is making sure that Bitcoin thrives and is secure. You know, and, and you, there's a couple, I, I wanted to, you, you kind of brought up some things and I, just to help clear it up, you, you did bring up oil and you brought up energy and it's, I'm not going to call them haters. Th those are my words. So I'm not, look, I'm, I'm not trying to put it on you, but there's folks who will come up with this crazy thing about how we're using up all the energy in the world. 
and they're literally writing these terrible things on paper that, that cut trees down that literally uses ink and i'm like wait a minute you're going to tell me sending a letter in using the snail mail is somehow better than using email i mean how can you tell me minting nickels and dimes is better for the environment than me using bitcoin have you I, what's your, your I, I just wanted to give you a little piece on the on the energy count because it comes up and i'm like contextually this doesn't seem like we're draining all the energy we're getting the most efficient energy but i i just yeah, yeah. no you you said it well contextually the the conversations lack context um i mean people look at they look at the bitcoin network and the energy usage and because it's so open and transparent you can actually see what the network uses which is a blessing but also here, here. people take that and then they say they put it up against like the energy consumption of a country and they're like can you believe this network uses the amount of energy of, of this smaller country over here without actually doing an accounting of the energy of the financial system the existing financial system or the postal system as you said you, you're writing a letter on paper that came from a tree it's going and being delivered on a on a vehicle there's you know all these handoffs right. part of this process um or and nobody sort of steps back and says well what's the global energy consumption of youtube or twitter or the internet uh or the iphone and so we we readily make these sort of trade-offs and like accept that the iPhone is is positive for for you know progress. Yes, it does have a footprint. It, it you know the the lithium batteries or the batteries have a cost. There's a mining um, those come from the earth, um, and we're making all these trade offs. But somehow Bitcoin is is sort of held to this unfair standard and put up against something out of context, without truly understanding like the positives of it. And you're saying, oh, this is this is not good. It uses too much energy. I mean, what is the value of trustless transactions occurring around permissionless and trustless transactions happening around you know the the world? Incredible value there. The, the ability to store value and all of that stuff is sort of completely discounted, pulled off the table. And it's like in isolation, let's look at the energy consumption as they're writing and sort of on Twitter, use, you know, <laughs> using the internet and not questioning any usage of any other technology. But, I, but we, you see this a lot with, with um, new technology, like it's always held to an unfair uh, standard. And so like a Tesla will, like one Tesla will, will, will catch fire on the freeway and it's like front page Wall Street Journal. Meanwhile, a hundred GM vehicles like, caught fire and had, you know, things happen or recalls that same day. But because it's been around for, you know, many decades or Ford's been around since what, the twenties, um, it's just not newsworthy. Um, but th these make good headlines. And when people are sort of searching, you know, for, for something to take issue with, Bitcoin tends to come front and center and it's all taken sort of out of context. Okay. And I, I try to tell folks, because you you're, of course, we agree. I'm just, this is the choir right now. We're about to do some hymnals. But mm -hmm. it literally, I say, be skeptical of everything, including that dollar, that piece of paper, or that plastic with that, like, like strip on the back from the cassette deck error. Like, be skeptical of everything. If you're going to be skeptical of Bitcoin, let's go ahead and just question everybody. But don't just question one thing and take the other one as gospel. That don't, like, let's, let's, let's have the conversation. Humbly, I, I just had to add a little, little something on top. Now, the other thing, and, I, I, and I'm sure the folks that uh, are gonna watch, they know, you know, you guys took a, one heck of a lead in this EFT, uh, that space, dealing with regulations. I, I remember um, New York had the bit license, like all these hoops and loops of getting, you know, it's a fragmented system. We were doing uh, remittances in Zimbabwe, one country, one rule, United States is really more than 50. I, I knew some politicians who couldn't tell us how many states we have, but there's definitely many jurisdictions <laughs> in addition to the 50 in order to kind of navigate all those issues that, you know, relate to, you know, being able to send and, and uh, FinCEN and all these other uh, 
uh, uh, regulatory bodies. I think, you know, again, and, and we don't say thank you enough for what you guys did have done in that particular area. So thank you for saying thank you here. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, no, Appreciate humbly. it. And, 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 I'm, and you got the bloody but about, I, I think I remember having that poem, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the arena and the gladiator, you know, and everybody yeah. got something to say, but you know, you know <laughs> the arena is the arena. Now that with all the, we're starting to see some gradual changes. And I, I think we all get, just tell us what the rules are. That's, we do want to know the rules. But I think there was a time when many folks in the community would say, hey, you guys were too conservative. You guys were taking this button up approach, making sure. And some of those folks aren't even around. Some of them are probably doing some pyramid, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. You guys have been able to, to, to make it from being in, you know, classified in that way to literally being an example in, in many regards. I mean, in, okay, this is a spectrum, fine. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, are the banks ultimately going to take this over? I think there was a time, like 2016, so I, I thought we were going to replace, like literally, we were, we, what we were doing with Bitmar, we were trying to replace Western Union. But what I'm seeing now with the regulatory, you know, I'm in DC, literally in the, regular, the regulatory bodies, even some of the legislation, if you were trying to just be in compliance, the amount of capital that you would have to have just to meet the regs seemed like it, it advantaged is the establishment. And some of the, the folks are out here, you know, we're just tinkering on the edges trying to, you know, make it, you know, make this work, you know, and of course we could talk about sandboxes and things like that. How do you, do you see, will we be able to keep the entrepreneurial spirit, the, the self-sovereignty, the things that so brought us to this space, uh, again, in a way that should be regulated, fine. Do you mm -hmm. see, where, where do you see this going? Are they gonna eat our lunch? Like, you know, they, what was that thing that first they don't they ignore you, then they think you're, I think the then they laugh forgot. at you, then they then play they, you, then you then you win. <laughs> they say then you win. But I think they're gonna buy us all up. Now talk, talk to me. Don't I, look. I'm, I'm not trying to do the fear thing, you know, but or uncertainty thing. But you know, what, how do you see this, you know, progressing? Because you've seen it from that space, like where you guys have followed these dots mm -hmm. and lived the dots and pushed the dots. Yeah. So I think I think that the usually like thoughtful the most vibrant markets um tend to have thoughtful regulation there's some you know there's there's thoughtful rules in place consumer protection and i think that there's always like this this strong partnership between the private sector and regulators and i don't i think crypto you know it will, will be very similar in the sense that thoughtful regulation is helpful i think it's good for everyone because it sort of tells you um where the rules are in the guideposts. It's hard to build in a gray area without certainty. It's hard to get a banking relationships because banks don't want to bank companies that they're not sure of. I think the cannabis industry, you know, is 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 facing all of these problems, right? There it, it it's it's super hard to get a banking relationship. And yet in some of the states it's it's legalized, but on the federal level, it's still like a tier one um substance and so it, it creates this really distortion where you can't it's like legalized everybody's you know innovating and using and there's tons of the demand and customers and you can't get a bank and you're just operating in cash it's like going back 100 years so um hopefully those things get worked out but i think ultimately you know the the challenge with with this is that we're dealing with value so you you don't necessarily want startups coming out of like dorm rooms and garages at the same time you don't want the barrier to be so high that only people with enough capital to have to fill the regulatory capital requirements and get the licensing and do that work can compete and enter the space i think that's one of the cool things about DeFi is it's sort of reducing a lot of these barriers and you're seeing these projects spring up and it's it's a couple of I, I think some like Ave that project is it's kids that just graduated college in Norway you know and they're, they're building this massive cool protocol um so I think that 
you know, you mentioned sandboxes and creating like innovation friendly zones and ways to get more people involved and like lightweight tiering it, not like one size fits all regulation. Gemini, our first license was a New York trust company license, very heavyweight. We were like a 15 person startup when we got our license, it took us 18 months and we had to really grow into that um, that type of regulation and, and that, that heavyweight nature. Um, but we, we, we could, we could sort of take on that challenge, but we just want to make sure that people can build in the space, but in a safe, in a safe way. I think the U S we're, we're working our way towards it, but it, it is, it is taking a lot of time. And some of the sort of regulation is done through enforcement um, which is great because it takes in, in, in some ways that when you take out like the clear, obvious frauds. Um, but I think you also want to couple that with like rulemaking and creating paths for people like that are, are, are straightforward so they can come and get licensed and it fits the size and nature of the business and, and what they're trying to do. I wouldn't recommend a New York trust company for a lot of startups. It's just right. <laughs> It's a huge bro, uh, right? undertaking. Man, that thing, bro, look at that's a, a lunch eater. And you're literally just trying, yeah. like you said, getting devs. Like even when e e Ethereum, you know, finding somebody who knows solidity, like the, even, even when I see all yeah. the projects out there, I'm like, if somebody who's like in the space, my full-time, you know, our lead developer is in town for the conference, but he's based in Nairobi, so praise God, or we'd be, you know, we wouldn't be able to scale as well because we would the cost. So when you talk about you need somebody to have a specific, you know, expertise in a particular field, plus no solidity, I'm like, yo, we just cut all the world out. Like this is a, a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you're saying in the the us needing to create an environment where we still can keep that energy. I guess my, you know, the, the question. And even when you brought the banks, I still remember, like we changed our company from BitMari, B-I-T, Mari means money in Shona, BitMari, to Bill mm -hmm. Mari. Because bro, we were tired of getting hit in the head and the neck in the face. Every time you say bit to somebody, they say, no, thank you. I'm talking yeah, the banks. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know if you remember R3, remember they came together, it was a consortium of yep. banks. Man, look, I said, all them consortium, just, just give us a bank account. Like, like look, all that, just y'all trying to figure yeah. out. Just allow us, I and mean, you might have some extra rules, but if you got coin, bit, like all that crip, you couldn't open nothing. Mm -hmm. And then when you finally yep. did, you had to open about a few. And our, our law firm that actually incorporated was uh, uh, Perkins Cooey. So we literally, like, we tried to leverage some, like, good names in the space just so, that, you know, when somebody asked about our documents, side eyed and I think so many folks that are super smart like you talking about Norway like coming up with real innovation and, and you, you see it in the defense I, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer by profession so I started I worked at McDonnell Douglas and, and different aerospace companies and literally the government was helpful like so you know again we don't talk about you know uh Ma Bell and Bell Laboratories. There was these quasi, you know, government mm -hmm. that got some money. They didn't have to really compete and they had a monopoly, but they, they really took that money and actually helped us do breakthrough things. And um, I think one of the issues is it's hard with regulatory, like when it's FinTech, when the regulations are there, it's hard to get some of those crazy ideas. Just like when I started seeing more defense spending, you know, Aerospace planes that fly all over. When you got folks just trying to make a bomb, it's kind of different. They're not, look, I don't need all that. The bomb. We're not trying to get too outlandish with our you know, engineering. It has to meet this budget. We got a, a four year contract. Let's cut the deal. How do we keep that? And I think you mentioned it too with the, the support y'all are giving to core de developers. But in this space that we're, that where we do see some very innovative people, but because there's a regulatory, where do you see the the balance, or do you think that's even possible now? Yeah, know. yeah, I'm not I'm not super concerned about like the incumbent banks sort of eating the lunch of of crypto companies. Um, I, I think that the culture of innovation, like it, just tends to not exist at those larger institutions. They're they're franchises, and it's all about playing defense and protecting 
what you have. Um, there's always been like a, a, every bull run banks like, oh, we're have a, a working group, digital asset or blockchain working group. They stand up 10, 20 people. They write some, some uh, analyst uh, 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 paper, but it, it sort of, okay, what actually becomes of it? And I don't think the banks are truly invested or bought in. They're sort of doing it. Uh, they have one foot in, one foot out. But I think ultimately they don't have um, cultures of innovation at this point. They're just so large and they're, they're too big to fail. They're heavily regulated. Um, and so, you know, I, do I think banks will uh, potentially buy different startups um, in this space? Maybe. And try and buy innovation. That, that's usually what you do if you can't actually innovate. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If we have, you know, a number of crypto founders that cash out. Uh, have good outcomes for them and their teams, and then go on to build that those next things. Um, but I'm I think that like um, generally speaking, there's just too much inertia, too much bureaucracy, and it becomes the innovator's dilemma. So that's not really what what we worry about a whole lot. Um, I worry much more about just like getting banking relationships, as you said, when you have Bit or Coin or anything crypto in your name, you're guilty. And they're like, no, now what's the question? <laughs> and I mean, even we're, we're eight years into this journey and there's still tons of resistance and tons of like, like, banks. Come on, ain't nobody resisting y'all. Come on, Cameron. Who tells you, you that, know, bro? Come on. You I'm, know, uh, I'm telling you. I don't know. Know. All right, I'm listening. I don't know Here. if I can give you names, but there, there's, <laughs> definitely, there's definitely banks that are still kind of resistant or, or don't want to underwrite the risk. Um, and are hesitant, you know, and and they're sort of second or third followers. They wait for for someone to to jump, you know, a couple of people to jump off the diving board first. That being said, J.P. Morgan banks us, and they they um, it took us about two years to get through that underwriting process, and I think we landed them as a bank two years ago, um, which is a big win, but it, it it takes a long time, and they they took a bit of a risk in in their you know, in, from their perspective. Um, but there's plenty of high street banks in the UK that won't go near it. Um, so we're, we're definitely, I mean, we made a ton of progress, but there's, there's a lot more to be made. And I, I totally understand what, what you're saying about having bid or, or anything in your name that, or business plan that is, is, you know, related to crypto. Right. And it, it all seemed like PR stunts stuff. I mean, if you were in the space, they were, oh, we're going to have this incubator, accelerate. Y'all won't even let me open an account. You're going to talk about the accelerator. Yeah. Man, come on, get out of here with that. Well, humbly. So thank you for knocking down. The, you get Jamie Diamond. You get some of those some of those big folks that, that do the right thing by us. I, and I think, again, that's one of the things we don't appreciate. We don't say enough because of some of the early success not because you guys weren't shooting in the gym. You're always doing the work. It does make it better for a lot of us in our position. So definitely a, a, a thank you again on that. What do you see now? Let's, some of the things that are more topical, you know, folks are talking about the merge. What are you, again, I'm, I'm coming from a space where I've been hearing these Ethereum folks and, and I'm not classic, or I'm not going to even go into it, but literally, you know, we've been talking about proof of work to proof of stake forever. And forever in our spaces, probably two, three, four, five, seven years. What are your thoughts? I know, I know it's going to so, happen. If I if I say if I'm skeptical of that, you're going to really say, "Look, I, I got on here. Sinclair is definitely a cuckoo bird. Of course, it's going to happen. It's happening." Okay, fine. I think it's going to happen, but I'm not like that close to it. So, for all I know, it gets pushed. Uh, out in the future a little bit, but it does feel like this time it's it's pretty concrete. And I guess the it'll be like the largest shift from a proof of work to a proof of stake. I mean, the amount of value sort of uh, in, in Ethereum, that'll be a pretty, pretty big event. Um, and it's probably the right thing for Ethereum. Um, it, it, it sounds like it's gonna increase the, the throughput and scalability quite a bit. And the other, there are other, sort of change in that space, like your Solanas that started proof of stake, like your Tezos that started there. Um, I don't think anybody started proof of work at that scale and size and shifted over. 
I think it's going to be a strong short-term catalyst for both Ethereum and the space as a whole. Um, because I think it's always positive when there's like those, those big breakthroughs or shifts, and this would be one of them. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's good for Ethereum. I think it's good for the entire space. Um, and, but it's probably like a short term and then, and I think the question will be like, and then, and then what's next? I mean, sort of zooming out, we have a pretty complicated global backdrop, you know, we're maybe in a quote recession, depending on who you talk to. Um, uh, but there's, you know, inflation is still like the Fed has to get a handle on that. Um, it sounds like they're still pursuing aggressive interest rate hikes. Um, and then you've got the whole uh, war in Ukraine, oil, the, the winter coming up. And so that's when the demand is going to really increase in, you know, for, for oil and, and, and heating and things like that in Europe. So there's a lot of wild cards and, and, and backdrop going on. Um, so it's, it's hard to know. I mean, does, 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 are we at the bottom? Does it, does it chop sideways for the next six to 12 months? Or do people sort of look past it all and say, well, okay, I, I've, you know, we're now three or four months into the invasion in Ukraine. I, I'm sort of gotten comfortable with the fact that that's happening. And it, it, it's just a thing. It's a risk that I now better understand where, where it's headed. Um, and I've priced in inflation and these different things, and they just sort of run over it and, and look more towards the positive side. There's sort of the, the upsides of crypto now that people aren't sort of running around with their hair on fire after the, that big sell-off, right? We had Luna and a couple like massive deleveragings, and then it sort of takes that out of the system. And are people now willing to sort of start um, uh, looking on kind of that, that upside again? Well, you, you kind of, you, you, you pulled in the, you, know, you took the Ethereum conversation to a few places. Now, I, I told you this before, there was a, a tweet that you did that was, and I was literally, like I said, in, in Poland, in Lublin. Lublin's like the closest major city to the Ukrainian border. And we had students from uh, Cameroon, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, which we were trying to leave and we we're helping them out. And I saw, I think it was March, March 15th. Yeah, March 15th, 2002. So that was, that invasion was like on and, and, and popping about that time. And you said Bitcoin is a monetary system that requires no violence to work. Mm -hmm. Now you're not you're not how like when folks listen to certain scriptures, certain words, certain things, they, they come up with their own things. I I can talk to you, so I don't have to think about this in some type of like somebody said this a hundred years ago. Cameron did this like this year. What were you saying? Break it down, please. Make it plain. Or were you just, so, or were you just waiting for somebody? You just, I'm like, I'm about to, like, I took it like, man, this is like, we even like the whole conference, like we're talking about violence and the peaceful solutions because of that tweet. So I hope we, it doesn't grow another life. But I would love to like have you say when when you put that out there in this incredible universe, the Twitterverse. What were you yeah, saying? it was it was cool. It was cool because it like uh, I think you you DM me and maybe even left like a voicemail. Like it really struck a chord with you. I was like, all right. Every once in a while, you you send out like an idea into Twitter, and you're like, I don't know if anybody will even read this. And then every once in a while, like things light up, and and it's kind of fun when when that happens, and you really strike a chord. But the if you sort of strip it down. We use dollars, U.S. dollars, because we actually we have to. Merchants in this country have to accept dollars. We have to pay our taxes in dollars. If you don't, you go to jail. It's illegal. And so, on that level, like fiat currency is coercive, um, and 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 it's ultimately people use it because they have no choice. And and like violence is sort of at that end point, right? You will go to jail if you if you don't use this thing. Bitcoin has none of those coercive uh, elements to it. Um, the people who, who use it um, or hodl it and buy it do it out of their own volition because they want to voluntarily. And so it's actually purely organic on that level. There's no, um, no one forcing you to use it. And if you 
the settlement layer of Bitcoin is also the transactions happen and they settle without violence. There's no military needed to enforce that. Now, ultimately, like if you get defrauded or someone tries to steal your Bitcoin, you will practically speaking, go to the, the court system and rely on that system. But that system, the sediment layer of that system is violence. Uh, yeah. Whether it's Marshall showing up and confiscating or saying, hey, you know, we're holding you in contempt or you, you, you broke your contract. Ultimately, that is that is backed by by the might and you know of the violence of armies and or law enforcement. And Bitcoin doesn't doesn't require that on the settlement layer. And there's nothing uh, forcing people to use it, which which makes where it is today that much more remarkable, because it's just purely an individual's choice. And I think that's sometimes missed by people when they're looking at crypto and fiat and show me something that's created trillions of dollars of demand in like a less, you know, in a decade, that's just purely like opt-in. And that's a remarkable thing. And when you, when you look at those different fact patterns, you realize like, this is inevitable. It's an inevitability. It's, it's going to happen. It's happening. We might be in like the trough of a wave, you know, at, at sort of in the winter or low point, but actually like just uh, directionally, this has been like an incredible decade and um, it's just so pure and so organic and just purely demand driven, which I think is, is incredible. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I'm not going to, we got some folks with different sensibilities, so I'm not going to. My mom might be watching. She's a good Baptist woman, but what you just laid down, brother, that 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 was like old covenant, new covenant, like that. And I'm and, and I'm not using. Let me say, and and we could even say that there's no marketing machine out there, you know, buying ad space for it. Like it literally, when you said it, one of the problems with even educating, just again, just taking what you said, I'm just trying to do a little jazz on top of what you said, a little riff, if you will. Too often, I now see people educating folks not into what you said, like getting down to, you know, first principle type, you know, I'm not trying to use cliche terms, but they more, they're more trying to figure out, especially when we're talking about the Black community, and this is in general, but particularly where Black folks, oftentimes, we over-index into some of these particular uh, platforms. Or, 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 or industries, there it's more of a consumerism. It's just digital. Like, okay, we we're gonna get you here. We got a we got a, a, a hustle over here. And now we got a multi level scheme over here. We're gonna do another multi level, but now it's digital. And we're gonna throw the word blockchain in or or crypto in it. And people are being taught how to use things without really understanding some of these fundamentals. And I. I think that even the way you, you just really said it, I, I I pray that you, especially in times of violence, like right now we're living in violence in a way that's so, we've so normalized it. We like just literally wars, like not mm -hmm. just in Europe, like wars are going on, like like literally. And we literally go about our every day. There's, I mean, I'm in DC, there's violence at scales that are very like, like alarming, like we you can't call it anything else. It's mm -hmm. alarming, and we don't speak to what and and how what we're doing impacts or shows an alternative to consensus building without mm -hmm. beating me in the head, bringing together folks from different walks of life with a common interest. You know what I'm saying? Even with our our, our Black Blockchain Summit. We say black communities because it's like 1.5 billion people of African descent. Now mm -hmm. it's about it's about 600 to 800 million of y'all, uh, Camera. Just I'm just you know European descent. Y'all did come over here and you got Australia now, but that's about 600 to 800 million. That's about 1.5 billion black folks that look like me with a nappy chip strap, like literally. And we're different communities, but being able to come together with all our tribes with this thing called Bitcoin, with this promise. And like I, I just think when you broke when you break it down, what you're saying about the violence part, I just you know it it makes me more you know even proud. Like this is what 
this is why we have these conversations. We are, mm -hmm. we don't need just philosophers. We are real, you know, people in a real space. And the fact that we're working in something that didn't and doesn't require violence, I just think it's super compelling. And and I know you don't have, you know, you, I've used up a lot of the, the time and it was, y'all got some things coming up, you know, that, that thing with the violence, you broke it down even more. So I mean, we, we're gonna make that like a special clip, a clip or something. What cool. can we see in the future? We got the credit card. We're going to get mass adoption. The next billion people, definitely credit card use is real. What else are you guys you know, doing and what do you see Gemini in the future and how it's going to impact us? Yeah, so I think the credit card's a big, a big product for us. Um, and I think a, a great way, we hope, the form factor of like onboarding that next 100 million people because we're saying don't change your behavior. People know what credit cards are. They're familiar with that, that piece of technology for I think going on 60 years now. We're just changing like the reward and, and what you get. And we're also creating a cool like experience. I think it's a better credit card banking experience with that. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. Um, Nifty Gateway has launched publishers tool. So self-service service uh, publishing of NFTs and drops. It's starting with a couple hundred publishers and creators right now, but we're hoping to expand that out to thousands where I think one of the hard things about NFTs is, is like it's to collect it. You kind of know where to go. You go to your nifty gateway or other marketplaces, but how do you create an NFT if you're a creative and you don't understand blockchain or, you know, the different smart contract languages, we're trying to make NFTs simple so that anybody can go and just mint their NFTs and create that, piece of art or, or part of a community or what, what have you. So those are two big things on, on the horizon. Um, and I just want to circle back to like what you were saying about um, Bitcoin and like education first principles is that I think that uh, it provides a really interesting way, like to short your government. If you don't like what your government is doing by holding dollars, you're actually like funding the government you're giving them credit and allowing them, you know, that that's, it's almost like an investment. But if you say, Hey, I'm going to take my dollars and put in Bitcoin, because I don't really like what you're doing. It's an interesting protest, if you will. Um, and, and it's also <laughs> like, there, there's a really big wealth transfer going on right now. The people who are getting the crypto and sort of see this as this new future um, the early adopters get rewarded for taking that risk. And there's all these boomers who are out there saying, no, like crypto is not going to work. And they're skeptical. And, and that's fine because they, they understand their world, the banking system and all the power structures that they grew up with. But those are being dismantled. And I think there's like this, this there will be this like big inflection point. Um, and, and we see like these young crypto whales who have, you know, built like fortunes in the blockchain and that will happen more and more. So I think like, it's easy to get like caught up in price and like the FOMO and the YOLO and, and all the, the meme stock, that, that whole sentiment. But I think like you said it well, like we, we really need to educate, continue to educate on a first principles basis, like zooming out, what does the next 20, 25 years look like? Um, and what does that mean? And then I think when, once people see that, they're like, oh, wait a second, I got to get on this. This is like Noah's Ark. There's all this inflation. There's all these problems over here. I need to get on this, this, this thing, this movement, um, because that, that's the future. And I think that that, like, I think a lot of people don't appreciate that, like, in the next five or 10 years, the majority of the workforce will be millennials. So the boomers, are saying all these things, throwing out FUD, trying to sort of over-regulate in some cases um, and throw cold water on, on, on Bitcoin and, and, and crypto. But it's actually like in a couple of years, it's all, you know, it's gonna be kind of moot because um, the workforce will be predominantly millennials and the money that they want and the future that they wanna live in is, is one of crypto.
And look, we're going we gonna to drop the mic on <laughs> Maybe that, there's... 